School buses are everywhere. They're literally part of the fabric of our traffic in the mornings and in the afternoons during the school year. When we're getting our driver's licenses, we have to learn the rules about when we can pass them or not. But have you ever stopped to think about how the school bus actually developed? It's rather fascinating, so come take a journey with me. And welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I am John, and this is a far too brief history of the school bus. I'll admit I hated the bus when I was in school, primarily because we had a driver who'd slam on the brakes when we all got too rowdy and we all go flying. But they're part of many students' lives, and some decisions made decades or over a century ago still impact their design today. Now imagine it's the mid-1800s in America. Most people were scattered across rural areas with poor roads, and children had to walk miles to their one-bedroom schoolhouse. If they were lucky, they could hitch a ride on a horse-drawn wagon that a farmer had. Of course, this is where the quote, I had to walk 10 miles uphill both ways through waist-deep snow every day just to go to school actually came from. With the time and the distances, not every child made it to school every day. But in 1852, Massachusetts made education compulsory. This actually built off of a previous similar law they passed in 1647 when it was still a British colony. It required that every city and town offer primary schooling focusing on grammar and arithmetic and included fines or other penalties to parents who refused to send their children. These penalties could include up to and including removing the child from the parents if they refused to send their child. By 1900, 31 other states had similar requirements. Notably, Mississippi was last in 1917. With the mandate that children attend schools, the kids had to actually get there. The schools began transporting the students in horse-drawn carts called kid hacks, which were little more than farm wagons typically open to the elements. One early company that saw the market was Wayne Works that produced utility wagons and carriages, and in 1892 they were commissioned by an Ohio school district to build a wagon specifically for transporting students. This was purpose-built, horse-drawn wagon with bench seating along the sides, a roof but no sides, and with a rear entrance door intended to avoid distressing the horses with the constant loading and unloading of passengers. While that rear entrance is now an emergency exit, it has its roots in the desire to not scare horses. History's cool, kids. By 1914, the auto industry was taking off and companies such as Wayne saw an opportunity for a horseless carriage. Early designs simply added the wooden bodies to a truck chassis, still with rear entry, side seating, and minimal weather protection. In 1915, International Harvester entered the market with their first school bus, and in 1919, the use of school buses became funded in all 48 states. 1927 was a pivotal year. Down in the middle of Georgia, a Ford dealer owner named A.L. Lucci was asked to produce a bus based on the Model T chassis for a contractor to drive his workers to and from the job site. Due to its wood construction, poor design, and really rough roads, it began to fall apart pretty quickly. And, well, A.L. decided to make future designs stronger with steel panels and using wood as a secondary and framing material. With the Great Depression collapsing his sales of cars, he sold both of his dealerships and started a company to produce just buses. This became Bluebird. In 1930, Wayne Works introduced the first all-steel bus with safety glass windows as an option and then standard in 1933. It's important to stop and consider the demographic changes occurring. Not only was Americans slowly becoming more urban, but the Great Depression forced the closure of many one-room schools across the country, and state and county finances pushed states to consolidate students into larger, multi-grade schools. All this helped drive the need for more buses. It was during the 1930s that the curbside door at the front was introduced to help ease the loading and unloading, and that rear door became repurposed as an emergency exit. Wayne remained a leader and began phasing in heavy-duty side rails that we now see on buses, and in 1936 redesigned their bus bodies to be sectional, allowing customers to add or remove sections for repair or to increase the capacity of the bus. 
1938, they introduced their first forward control bus some six years after their competitor, Crown Coach, introduced their Super Coach model. Bluebird wasn't far behind Wayne, beginning production of an all-steel bus body in 1937, and in 1940, Gillig in California introduced the first mid-engine school bus. By the late 1930s, with multiple competitors all essentially building custom buses, there was a dramatic lack of standards across the industry, which could frustrate customers and restricted ramping up volume production. In 1939, rural education expert Dr. Frank W. Sear organized a week-long conference at Teachers College at Columbia University. Transportation officials, representatives from both body and chassis manufacturers, and paint companies attended with the intention of reducing complexity and increasing safety. Forty-four standards were agreed upon and adopted, including interior and exterior dimensions, using forward-facing seating, the aisle width, emergency brakes, and most famously, the adoption of a standard paint color. Before this, buses could be painted essentially any color, and a panel had color strips they hung on the wall to discuss and choose from. Originally known as National School Bus Chrome, it was adopted as it was considered the easiest to see at dawn, at dusk, it was visible in poor weather, and fascinatingly, it was one of the ones that saw the most reaction time from the corner of your eye. So it was easy to see and easy to notice, and it contrasted well with black lettering. The color today is known as National School Bus Glossy Yellow, with the removal of the primary pigment Chromium Yellow, which at the time contained lead. While not used worldwide, this yellow is easily recognized on school buses in the United States and Canada. My wife insisted that I add the RGB color number here for that yellow, so here you go, pound F5A400. And if you're interested, it's federal standard color, 13432. There you go. After the war, societal changes with the rapid increase in suburbs continued to drive school consolidation and the need for buses. And in 1946, the ubiquitous flip out stop sign was added. From the 1950s on, the baby boomer generation led to a substantial increase in student populations, once again driving the need for developments of the school bus. Seating capacity grew, heavier duty chassis were used, and in 1954 the first diesel engine bus was introduced and the first tandem axle bus in 1955. For more urban routes, smaller school buses were developed to meet the demands of crowded and narrow streets. Through the 60s, safety became the primary concern. While very safe overall, it was identified that the weakest point of the body was the actual body joints. Manufacturers would use few rivets, and in an accident, these joints could split and actually harm the passenger. In 1973, Wayne introduced a school bus body with single-piece side and roof panels. Today, buses use minimal number of panels and rivet quantity and spacing are all regulated by government standards. Societal changes in the 70s by busing students for integration continued to increase demand for buses. And through the 70s, safety advancements often focused not only on collisions, but safety for those around the bus. Amber warning lights in board of the red stop lights were mandated. A stop arm with its own flashing light was added. In 1973, the first federal regulations governing school buses went into effect. This covered specifications around the emergency exit doors and windows, and in 1977, the NHTSA introduced their safety standards for buses with most regulations around the body structure, including rollover protection and the body panel joints we mentioned earlier. One big change was requiring taller seats surrounded by thick padding. In essence, in the event of a crash, the back of the seat in front of the student acts like a padded, quote, airbag. In the 1980s, after decades of increasing demand, school bus manufacturers began to struggle with overcapacity. The baby boomer generation was graduating, and a decrease in student growth began around the same time as a recession, and then much later, the stop to busing for integration. Through the 80s and the 90s, there were multiple ownership changes and joint ventures formed. Venerable names like Ward entered bankruptcy, and by 1993, Superior, Carpenter, Crown Coach, Gillig, and Wayne had all been bankrupt and closed or reorganized to emerge and try again. 
Navistar acquired the remnants of Ward, Carpenter was acquired by Spartan Motors, and Thomas built, the last major manufacturer to be under a family control, was sold to Freightliner. Even Bluebird changed hands several times after the Lucci family decided to sell at a time when the company had nearly 50% of the market. Most advancements in the 80s and the 90s were around the driver. In 1986, school bus drivers were required to have a CDL, automatic transmissions became more common, driver ergonomics were improved with the intention of decreasing driver distraction, and an overall focus by chassis and body manufacturers to increase driver visibility. Blind spot mirrors became common after being introduced in the 60s, and additional emergency exits such as the roof-mounted hatch were introduced. Around this time, while the conventional bus remained the most produced, the transit-style bus became more popular with its advantage of better forward visibility, increased passenger capacity, and shorter turning radiuses. Since the beginning of the 2000s consolidation, a wave of new generation school buses has occurred. In past decades, customers would usually select chassis and body manufacturers independently, but that effectively ended with Navistar and Freightliner owning two of the larger companies, and Ford and GM both leaving the cowled chassis market in 2003. Freightliner and International both introduced new chassis in 2004 and 2005, respectably, but in 2003, Bluebird introduced their new Vision line with its own proprietary chassis. This had a steeply sloped hood, larger glass to improve loading zone visibility, and a similar concept was introduced by Thomas in 2004. Safety-wise, LED lights began to replace incandescents, crossing arms introduced in the 90s became more common, seat belts became mandated in some states, at least five at last count, GPS tracking expanded to help fleet management as well as giving real-time information for parents on where the bus is located, and in some cases buses would be equipped with cameras synced with the stop arms to catch drivers illegally passing loading buses. Finally, school buses have been leaders in alternative fuels. Propane fuel began to be used in the 70s largely in response to the energy crisis, then fell out of usage again in the 80s with an increased use of diesel. Then propane reappeared in the 2000s. Compressed natural gas was introduced in the 90s with Bluebird building their first in 1991 and Thomas in 1993. Fascinatingly, the 90s, several prototype buses were built and by the 2000s diesel electric hybrids were developed, although they were largely not accepted due to their very high price. With the improvements in battery technology, in the 2010s fully electric buses hit production from Transtech and Lion Bus, which was founded in 2011 based in Quebec. In 2015 they introduced the E-Lion, the first mass-produced fully electric powertrain school bus. For all the changes, you can go back decades and a school bus is instantly recognizable with an evolutionary approach to the design. Modern buses are much cleaner than they were just 20 years ago and there's a push coming to move to fully electric bus fleets. And they remain among the safest forms of transportation available. For all the students and all the vehicle trips nationwide, less than 0.4% of fatal motor vehicle crashes involve school buses and on average that's only between five and seven passenger deaths a year. That's over 70 times safer than a car. And the statistics continue to be astonishing. Over 26 million students use the bus with nearly 500,000 buses traveling almost 6 billion miles a year. School buses represent the nation's largest public transportation fleet with two and a half times more vehicles than all other mass transit combined. It's estimated that each bus replaces 36 individual vehicles on the road with a net savings of 4,800 gallons of gas per bus being used. 20% of all school buses in the country are in California with over 100,000 there. Thanks for being here and a special thanks to my Patreons for their continued support. If you enjoy news opinions and histories like this, please give me a like. Thanks much, guys.